is okay. I really do enjoy and love being together with my brothers and sisters. Um, it's, been a, it's been a really great week. I've seen God doing some amazing things. Um, hey, Red, do we got a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Don't know? Okay, we got a thumb sideways. Gotcha. Well, we were going to welcome somebody. We weren't sure if they were going to be here this morning, but uh, we'll, we'll save that for when they are here, and we'll introduce you to your new sister in Christ. But please be in prayer uh, for our friend Dylan. Um, Dylan has been studying the Bible, and uh, we did we finished the, the final study with him, and, and we were counting the cost. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if that makes a lot of sense to you, but what we do before someone surrenders their life to Christ, we actually count the cost with them. Because there is a price to pay when you're serving Jesus. And so Dylan, man, he is wrestling with this. He is really grappling with this. And we just ask that you pray for Dylan. And I know he would appreciate that. He is really wrestling with what he's going to do. And I, I just feel confident he's going to make that decision. And it's going to be awesome. But be, be in prayer about Dylan. And uh, Bianca, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's Bianca became a new disciple who's been uh, coming for many weeks. And we'll, we'll welcome her properly when she finally gets here. But uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we want you to know, I, I hope that you can kick back, you can relax, and you can leave here with something that will bless your life this morning. That you won't just check off a box of, okay, I did my religious thing to do this morning. Uh, I had my little intellectual exercise where somebody talked to me and I thought it was kind of neat or whatever. But I hope that you really do open your heart and open your mind wide to what God might want to say to you this morning. And, and so we're in a series... Um, it's titled Unmistakable. We've been going for, this is our third week in the series, and we've only talked about a couple of things, but the idea behind this, it, all the lessons are coming from the letter that we call First Peter. It's the, the letter named after the author, the Apostle Peter. And all these lessons are primarily coming from that letter. The first week, we talked about how can we have unmistakable confidence and I asked, raise your hand if you've ever struggled with confidence. And if you didn't raise your hand, we, we were very quick to inform you that you probably should have. Because you've either struggled with not having enough confidence, or some of you maybe had a little too much confidence when you shouldn't have, right? But it, one way or the other, I guarantee you most people in this audience, if not all, have struggled with confidence. And so we talked about that. And here's the powerful thing about this, this sermon series. It's coming from a letter that was written to a bunch of Christians who were kind of on the run because they were being persecuted. And I'm not talking about people who were saying bad things about them. I'm talking about their lives were in danger. This, this kind of severe persecution. And it's in this letter to these Christians who are being severely persecuted that we learn lessons about how to be unmistakably like Jesus. Because, you see, what's interesting about that is you would think that when things are easy, then, then it would be kind of time to be unmistakably Christian. Like this morning, I'm kind of unmistakably a Christian guy, right? I'm preaching a Christian sermon. I'm unmistakable, right? But what about when I go out in the world and somebody cuts me off in traffic? Will I be unmistakably like Jesus in that moment? You know what I'm saying? And so when, when this severe persecution was happening, that's still when their face showed up and showed out and they were unmistakably confident and bold. When you would have thought they would have been cowardly and hiding, they stepped forward and were confident and bold. And then last week, we talked about how can we have unmistakable holiness. And so we talked about what does it mean. So this morning... What I want to do, because I couldn't finish what I wanted to do last week, we're going to have part two this morning. But for those who weren't here for part one, don't worry. We're going to get a very fast, you better buckle up, because we're going to do a very fast review of what we talked about last week. In your bulletin when you came in, you got a little pamphlet, right? Open that up. On the inside, you'll find some notes. This is going to help you follow along. And the first three points that you see on your notes are simply points of review so we're going to go through this very fast okay but let's do it and then we're going to get to point number four which will be the new content for this morning but I think for those that weren't here you need to get caught up and for those that were here I think it's helpful to have a reminder okay before we get to point four so let's do this very fast you got your pens ready you buckled up all right here we go if we're going to have unmistakable holiness it's only going to come when I embrace what 
it means to be holy. The first thing we talked about was what does it mean to be holy? Does it mean holy cow, holy moly, holy guacamole, holy Toledo, holy smoke? Maybe you've heard holier than thou. Maybe you went to a holiness church somewhere in the past. All these words holy are thrown around and used in different ways, but what does it really mean? And we pointed out, and this is what I want you to make sure that you're caught up on and remember, is that you can't have a definition biblically of holiness without Jesus being a part of that definition. Because part of being holy literally means to be like Jesus. That's what it means. So, the first thing we needed to do, we looked at John chapter 6, verse 68 through 69. Look at that really quickly. It says, Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom, should, whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the what? The Holy One of God. So Peter, the one that we're reading the letter from, right? The one that we're getting our theme from, this letter from Peter. Peter is the one talking to Jesus here and he goes, you're the Holy One of God. And so built into the character, the nature of Jesus is the idea of holiness. So if you want to be holy, there's no way to do it without becoming like Jesus. There's no way to do it. And we talked about this. I said there's probably a lot of you in the room, anybody who spent any kind of time in church, you've heard holy talked about probably once or twice. And if I asked you to come up on the stage, you could probably give me what you see on your outline there, the prescribed definition of holy, which is something like set apart for God's purpose, right? Set apart for some purpose that's notable. Most people can give that answer, and it's correct, but I wonder about the practical definition, which we've been talking about already, and I'll say again, being different. That holy means being different than the world and being like Jesus. By the way, if you're like Jesus, you will be different than the world. There's no way around that. He was different from the world. In fact, the world didn't like his different so much that they actually killed him for his different. And the King James Version, we brought it up last week. King James, I love the, the way that it, it, it brings this particular passage to bear. It says, in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But you're a holy nation, a peculiar people. <laughs> right? And some of y'all are peculiar, all right, already. <laughs> Forget the Jesus thing. Some of y'all are just weird, right? And y'all own that, right? I'm kind of one of those dudes, all right? I'm kind of weird. My kids are nodding. No, she's not nodding, but she should be. She knows. And, um, but anyway... We're not talking about, when we read this, it's not like a license to be weird and go freak people out with your oddities. That's not what this is about. But it's saying, if you're really like Jesus, you will be odd. You're going to stand out like a sore thumb. And there's no avoiding that. So what does it mean to be holy? It means to be different. It means to be like Jesus. Secondly, if you want to have unmistakable holiness, remember that we talked about this, that we must embrace that I'm called to be holy. So not only do we need to embrace what holiness is, we need to embrace that we're actually called to be holy. Now, here's the thing. Some of y'all really need to listen to this. Because this point, I think there's, there's disagreement on it. And, and that's why we had this point. Because some, I think, have written things off to say, I can't be holy. And you hear it in their language. We talked about this last week. When you hear people saying, well, no one's perfect. When you hear people say things like, I'm not Jesus, or this is just who I am and it's who I always will be. And all of us have heard those statements. Maybe some of us have even said those statements. I remember, guys, and I've told you this before, a part of my story. I remember when I was deciding myself, wrestling with whether I could surrender and give my life to Jesus. One of the things that I thought about was, I don't think I can quit cussing. And I know that's a parameter. I know that's something that it says I have to do. I didn't think I could. And I remember saying, well, I guess I can't be a Christian. That was my thought process. That's how ingrained that crap was in my life. But here's the thing we talked about. That all of those are just cop-outs when you say, well, no one's perfect. No one, I'm not Jesus. Those are cop-outs because God absolutely calls us to be holy. Look at 1 Peter 1.15. It says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. And remember, I gave you a Greek lesson. Remember I told you what the Greek word for all means? All. Yeah, somebody listen. All right. It means all. It doesn't mean some things. It means all that you do. That's what it means in the Greek. So now y'all are smarter. Here we go. But it says, be holy in all you do. And remember, we talked about this. 
God is not going to call you to do something that he's not willing to empower you to do. He's not just giving, setting you up for failure. Oh yeah, I'll tell them to be holy. They'll never do it and then they'll get depressed about it. That's my plan. That's not God's plan. He is going to help you get to where he's calling you. But you've got to put in the work and acknowledge that we are called to be holy. The next verse there in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now say this with me. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Say that. Now, I want you to change it from no one to someone that you love dearly that isn't in Christ right now, that's not in a saved condition with God. And I want you to, I want you to hear this. He says, without holiness, you fill in the blank, will not see the Lord. Now, that can be talking about yourself or it can be talking about those that you're going to have an influence with. It could be talking about your kids. It could be talking about your family, your spouses. It could be talking about your coworkers, your best friends. But without holiness, no one's going to see the Lord. I didn't say it. God said it. And so he calls us to this, that we've got to become holy. And remember, we said this. Christianity is not about being like Jesus as much as it's being... I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Christianity is not about being saved by Jesus. It's more about being like him. I think I got that flipped on your notes. But anyway, the point is, we all want to be saved by him. But how many of us are willing to become like him? Everybody wants to be zapped with this holiness, but how many of us are willing to put in the work where it says, make every effort to be holy? You got to put in the work, and God will meet you there. Number three that we talked about last week, and we'll wrap up with this one for our review and then dive into the new stuff. But we've got to embrace why we're called to be holy. See, God has always been, uh, he's always prioritized the why. Motive is big with God. And, and the first thing that we pointed out is that I'm called to holiness because God is holy. If you see 1 Peter 1.16, it says, the scriptures say you must be holy. Why? Because I am holy. It makes sense though, right? That we would want to be holy. Because our Father is holy. We want to be like the Father. That makes sense. I remember wanting to be like my dad. I was terrified of bees and anything that flew, really. I was terrified of that. I know that's hard for y'all to imagine because I'm not anymore. But part of that was I was terrified. He would say, boy, go swat that wasp yourself. And I'm like, you know, and I get my fly swatter. I'm shaking. I was like, he's going to sting me. And I swing and I miss. And he starts. And so I run. And I, and I remember my dad had a beer store, and we would go, our house was attached to this liquor store. And so I would go in through the door that exits our house and goes into the beer store. And he had a little counter there that he had wine sitting up on top of. And I remember he would have little boxes there. And I went and sat on one of those little boxes, and I whimpered ever so softly, just loud enough that he would hear me. And he came around there, and he goes, you didn't swat it, did you? <laughs> and I was like, no, I didn't. And he goes in there. He said, boy, come here. And so he, he grabs me by the hand. He takes me into the living room. I still see him, you know, flying around. He goes, is that it? I said, yes. He, goes, he walks up to it and he smacked it out of the air with his hand. And I go, my dad is Hercules. This is awesome. And I couldn't believe it, right? And, and you know, I had this full circle moment. I was at camp, teen, teen camp that a lot of your kids have gone to and a lot of our kids go to. And there was a big, one of those giant um, carpenter bees and the bigger they are and, you know, and the louder they are, the, the kids were so distracted. I was trying to teach them a lesson. They were distracted watching that. And I go, guys, are y'all serious? It's just a bee, man. It's just a bee. But then I remember, man, it's not just a bee. I used to be terrified of those things. So I walked up with my bare hand, and I smacked that bee out of the air, and I stomped it. And all the kids go, and I, I had that full circle moment. I go, they think I'm Hercules, you know. Now I got them. Now I can deliver a message to them. And it was awesome. But listen, we need to be like our dad. He's holy. Now, if you go a little bit further down uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, listen to what he says. We're not only called because he's holy, we're also called to holiness to fulfill God's purpose. And this passage says as much. It says, but you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work. 
Remember we talked about priests are not just the ones with the backward collar. But you're called to be priests and do priestly work. All Christians. You're chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him. To tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. And remember I asked you a question. Has it been a night and day difference? Or has it been more like 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. difference? Right? It just got a little brighter. And listen, if it's just got a little brighter right now and that's where you're at, cool. But what we need to understand is that God can and wants to make a night and day difference in our lives. So that it is unmistakable. But we need to understand that part of that is because he wants us to be holy because... Otherwise, we're not going to fulfill his purpose that he has in our lives. And then lastly, in that point, is, you'll see this on your notes. When I'm holy, I also bring glory to God and I bring hope to other people. You see, if we're not being holy, we're going to do damage. That means we're unholy. And unholiness doesn't just hurt you. It hurts the people around you that you influence. It hurts your relationship with God. You don't bring glory to him. And it hurts your impact on other people. And guys... How do we dare say we love people, but we do damage to them because we're not willing to put in the work to be holy as he's called us to be holy? We need to understand the why. We need to understand the what. We need to understand the that. But this morning, let's dive in to the how. If I'm going to be unmistakably holy, I need to embrace how I can become holy in all I do. And the first thing I want to give you, I'm only going to give you two things. We're going to dive into each one of them. But the first one is, I commit to a different way of thinking. This is where you always have to start. Do you know how I conquered cussing? I changed my thinking. You know how I first tried to conquer cussing? By having my buddy punch me in the arm. By having a tip jar. For every time I said a word, I had to put money in it that I didn't get back. But my thinking didn't change until, and here's what did it. I remember this. My mom may not because there were a lot of instances where I cussed in front of my mom, okay? But in this instant, I remember it like it was yesterday. And I remember I had, I had made a decision to follow Jesus, and I had been open about that with my mom and dad. And I had told them that this was this new life that I was doing. But then in the course of the conversation, I used A cuss word, again, in the context even, in the same breath as I was talking about Jesus and how he's changing my life. And then I cussed like I would normally do. And I remember my mom going, oh yeah, that really sounds like a Christian. She may not remember that, but I remember that. And then, but that was, man, that was like, that was like world changing for me. Because what happened inside me was my brain changed because I go, you know, if I ever want to have an influence on my mom, who wasn't a Christian at the time, if I ever want to have an influence on my dad, who wasn't a Christian at the time, those people that I say I loved, I needed to man up and I needed to quit. I needed to change. But that was the first time that I connected it up here and my mind changed. And it had to do with me wanting to help someone else that I loved. In Romans chapter 12, look on your notes. Romans chapter 12, it's also on the screen, verse 2. The Apostle Paul talks about our thinking. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Now, I need some volunteers. Does anybody want to volunteer? Okay, come on up, Constance. Um, let's come on up. Come on up. Yep. Jalen, Jaden, uh, come on up. Come on, Conrad. Where's some others? Come on up, buddy. Come on. Let's go. Anybody else? This is a pretty good crew. Um, yeah, come on. Come on. All right, that's the last one. Get up on the stage so they can see you real good. All right, give them a a hand for their bravery. They don't know what a Mackie, uh, illustration looks like yet. Maybe. (laughs) Okay, Listen. You just stand up there and be pretty for now, okay? All right. He's got it right. He's hiding behind his brother. Okay. Listen. We, it says don't copy the behavior and customs. Listen. We are amazing copycats. We are. We copy everything. We copy the way people walk. 
We copy the way people talk, whether it's an accent or slang that we use. If someone's like purr, then we're saying purr, right? It, it doesn't matter what it is. We are copycats. Even when it's stupid stuff like that, that makes zero sense, by the way, purr. Make, like rough, all right? That's the alternative. I don't know what the dog does. Anyway, listen, we copy. We're experts at it. In fact, look at this picture. Y'all know this game? Y'all ever heard of This is all about copying, right? You see the sound, you hear the, you see it light up, you hear the, the distinct sound for that color, and then it starts getting harder. It gives you different sequences that you got to follow. Well, this game wasn't just a handheld toy. This was known as Simon, but there's another game. What is it called? Simon Says. Let's play it, shall we? <clears throat> All right, so uh, you guys ready? All right. So y'all know how Simon Says works. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, let's start by, uh, just spread out just a little bit so everybody can see you. All right, y'all are out. Move, uh, get, out get off the stage. Simon didn't tell you to do that. Here, get off the stage. Sorry, I'm, a, I'm ruthless at this. Did you move? Did you move? We're going to give you benefit of the doubt. Your brother, your brother moved you. I'm going to say that. All right, here we go. You stay on stage. Sorry, Conrad, you get really ripped off there. All right, you guys ready? All right. Simon says, raise your right hand. Some of y'all have to think about that really hard. Which one is my right? <laughs> All right. Simon says, take your right hand and scratch your nose. I should have told you to pick it. That would have been funnier. All right. Simon says, raise your left hand. All right. Put your left hand down. All right. Y'all are out. That's okay. It's, it's a rough game. I mean, it's hard. That's a lot to keep track of. Two arms in there, you know. All right. Um, Simon says, put your left hand down. Simon says, put your right hand down. Put your right hand up. Simon says, put your right hand up. Simon says, wave it in the air. Stop waving. Oh, you're going. It's okay. All right. So, uh, uh, give it up for your champion. You can have your seat. Give it up. Give it up. Uh, you're also out because I didn't say Simon said, go to your seat. So you lost too. Yeah, sucks to suck. Anyway, that's one of them things I copied, you see, from my teen. Suck to suck. Anyway, yeah. Well, all right, but listen, that was fun, right? We're good at copying. Some of us not so good. All right, Conrad, you know what I'm saying? We got some work to do. But that's probably good, bro. When it comes to, like, copying the world, you're going to be the least likely to do that. It's awesome. All right, love you. All right, so <laughs> he's like, bro, leave me alone. Listen, I'm sorry to so unceremoniously uh, send you to your seat, but uh, we got to do what we got to do to make a point. Listen, you know what's harder than Simon says? You know what's harder? Jesus says. I want you all to think about Jesus says for a minute, because that's the only way you're going to be holy, is if you play the game of Jesus says and you play it well. And you play it better than some of us played Simon says, okay? In fact... It's Jesus. I know the Apostle Paul wrote that last. Bring that verse back up. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I know the Apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Rome. But listen, it was only through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God. And Jesus is God. And so Jesus is saying to us, we're playing the game Jesus says. And he says, don't copy the world. The word copy here, by the way, and this is just extra for you. This is all for free. Suskemata tizo. Now, the middle of that word is schema. It's where we get the word for scheme or pattern. And so literally a lot of the translations will say don't conform or copy the pattern in the world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this passage says become a new person by the way you think. What I want you to notice here, look at this text. It says don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. But let God transform you into a new person. Number one, do you believe he can do that? I need y'all to think about that for a second. Do you believe God can transform you into a new person? Or do you think you're stuck with being who you are? Listen, the one who rose the dead is the one calling us to be different. If he can turn death into life, I think he can turn us into a new person. And here's the other thing. As we go through this a little bit more, it says, Then, 
by changing the way you think, then you'll learn to know God's will for you. Do you want to know God's will for your life? He says, first things first. I'm a realist. No, that's not what he said. First things first, you need to change the way you think. Then you'll know God's will. You don't change the way you think. You just keep going down that road. You're not going to know God's will. That's the alternative, right? This idea of repentance, changing your mind. The Greek word is metanoia. It literally, anytime you see repent in your Bible, it literally means to change your mind. Change the way you think. Change your worldview. It says only when you metanoia, only when you change your mind, are you going to know God's will. Now, the second blank, fill this in. Not only do you need to think differently, but you need to think more specifically proactively, not passively. Some of y'all are passive thinkers. You need to be proactive thinkers. Remember, God wants to change you and make you holy, but we have a role in it. We have to proactively work on this. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with the King James Version and also this other version we're about to look at. It's called the American Standard. It's very similar. It's very old, just like the King James. I have a love-hate relationship. The reason I hate it, I don't really hate it, okay, but the reason I do at times is because when folks, that's the only version they have, and they're struggling with it like anybody would struggle with Shakespeare, and they can't get the message, that irritates me. But there are times when I love it because it brings something out that none of the other newer translations seem to bring to bear. And I think this is one of those cases, kind of like the peculiar comment earlier. But look at what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 in the American Standard Version. It says, wherefore, instead of therefore, they always say wherefore. All right. Wherefore, girding up the loins, whoa now, of your mind, be sober. We got the sober part, right? We know what that means. <laughs> but what in the world does girding up your loins? What you talking about loins? I thought we were talking about our mind. Yeah, the loins of your minds. I didn't know my mind had loins, right? What is this about? Well, let me tell you. So during this time, they didn't wear shorts like this. They didn't wear pants. They wore tunics. Even the soldiers would wear tunics. They were draped down to the floor. But then the soldiers, when they go to war, they would have to first gird up their loins. In other words, they would pull their tunic up, wrap it, fasten it with their belt, and then they could run without worrying about tripping and falling. So what is this saying? Why would he use this language to gird up the loins of your mind? And I'm here to tell you, he's basically saying, prepare your mind for action. I'm not making this up. We need to think proactively. We need to gear our minds, get it ready for battle, get it ready for war. We need to get our, ready, our minds ready for action. The, other, um, the message paraphrase of this same verse, look at it on your notes or on the screen there. It says, so roll up your sleeves, get your head in the game. Right? We know what rolling up your sleeves means, right? It means you're about to get your hands dirty. You're about to be active. You're about to do something, so you roll your sleeves up to keep them from getting dirty. And he says, then get your head in the game. Like, we need to be proactive if we're going to be holy. Proactively thinking, planning, scheming. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, In that same way that nursing infants cry for milk... You must intensely crave the pure spiritual milk of God's word. For this milk will cause you to grow. Now, what does this have to do with our thinking and changing our thinking? Listen, some of y'all don't crave God's word like a baby craves mama's milk. Some of y'all don't do that. Some of y'all look at God's word as a chore. There's not a baby on the planet when they get hungry that looks at breastfeeding as a chore. They think, man, where is mama? In fact, I know this very well. Listen, my kids growing up, Nathan and Kayla, when they were babies, and then they became toddlers, and then they became these ugly things called teenagers. No, <laughs> no, I love them. They're awesome. Uh, they really are. That's not just words. I'm so proud of them. But anyway, um, they went through phases. But let me tell you, when they were baby babies, they went through phases where sometimes they were daddy's girl daddy's boy 
But there were other phases where they were not daddy's girl and daddy's boy. They were mama's girl and mama's boy. There were different phases. But when they were babies, they were mama's. When they got hungry, and we breastfed both. I, we, I say we. She, bre- I always do that. I know, I always do that. Uh, we're one, okay? I was there. I watched. I supported. Anyway, listen. <laughs> but listen. When they got hungry... I could be the funniest dude on the planet, and it worked when they weren't hungry. They thought I was hilarious. Still do, right? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> no, but when they got hungry, wasn't none cutting it but mama. In fact, they would smell her. I, they could smell her. It was amazing. They could smell mama's milk, and nothing was going to satisfy except mama because mama had the goods, and daddy didn't. And we need to become like those babies where there is nothing. I will have a full come apart if I can't get to God's word. We need to get to that thinking. Like if I can't get to God's word the way that, that, man, they would have a come apart if mama wasn't around. There was nothing else that would satisfy. What about God's word? We've got to get to a point where we view God's word that way. And if you don't, something's broken. And you're going to struggle getting to holiness if you don't view God's word that way. Stephen Covey. Uh, Let's bring his quote up here. He he wrote seven habits of highly effective people. And this is a part of that. One of the things that he points out, he says, private victories precede public victories. You can't invert that process any more than you can harvest a crop before you plant it. What is he saying? He's saying, guys, you've got to spend some alone time with God. We talk about quiet times. That's our sort of language for it. But that just means you get alone with God's word where nothing else is distracting you. Just like a baby would get with mama to handle that business of breastfeeding, right? You get alone with God and you listen to what he says and you talk to him. See, let me, let me put some, some nonsense to rest. When I say go, get in, uh, go to your prayer closet or go get in your quiet time with God and you talk to him and then listen to him. Some people will say, okay, I'll say a prayer, that's me talking to him, and then I'll get really quiet and just listen for God's voice. I'm going to put that to rest. Here's what you need to do. You need to pray, and then you need to open up his word and let him talk. It needs to be a two-way conversation. And then when he talks, you go, well, wait a minute, what about this, Lord? And you talk about it, and you have that time with God. But let him talk. Don't fall into the trap of you've got all these thoughts swirling around in your mind, and you stamp them, God. Let him speak. He has spoken. And it's a living and active word. It's not dead and dormant. So let him speak. And have an awesome quiet time. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. Listen to what it says. It says, for if you possess these qualities. You go, what qualities? Well, if you look back at the beginning of this chapter. What you'll understand is it's the famous chapter where he says, add to your faith. All right. He says, you got faith? Add to it. And he gives this long list of things that you need to add to your faith. But he says, that's your responsibility. You add to your faith. And then he comes in and says this, for if you possess all these qualities that you're adding, right, in increasing measure, circle increasing measure, then they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Here, Peter had told them all these qualities that they need to add to their faith. And this is the idea of becoming holy, by the way. And notice, it says, if you have these qualities in increasing measure, that means you're growing, you're progressing, it will keep you from being unfruitful. We have to never stop progressing. We can never stop changing our minds to become more like Jesus. We have to continue. In fact, it says those that don't, Those are the ones that are blind and short-sighted. They can't see past their own nose. And it's because they've forgotten that they were cleansed from their past sins. Well, at Crossway, we try to make sure that doesn't happen. Every week, we take of what we call the Lord's Supper, and it's all about remembering. It's all about making sure we don't forget 
the sacrifice of Jesus. And it's connected to us changing the way we think. So this morning, I'm going to pray. We're going to take the Lord's Supper, and I want to encourage you to think in that direction. I want you to think, God, help me remember the sacrifice and the forgiveness of sins that you offer and that I have if you're a disciple this morning and help it to prompt me to change my thinking continually to be progressing and adding to my faith so I can be more like your son and I can have the influence in this world that I need and that you want me to have. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. Um, Without that, we wouldn't have forgiveness of sins. Without that, we wouldn't have um, the life that that you offer to us. So God, I pray this morning as we um, take of this little piece of bread and this little cup of juice that we'll remember the body and the blood of Jesus and it will motivate us and prompt us toward holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love.
All right, so not only do we need to change our thinking um, by being more proactive, we need to change our thinking and be more hopeful. We need to think hopefully, not pessimistically. And I chose this word for a reason, guys, because you could easily say the opposite of pessimistic is optimistic. Our problem is, though, when you're optimistic, sometimes that's not realistic. In fact, we can see that in this picture. This monkey has no shot of catching this elephant. So optimism is not always the best option. We need to think hopefully. And when I say hopefully, y'all have heard me say this enough, I'm not talking about wishful thinking. I'm talking about true biblical hope, which means it's always connected to the promise of God. So when we think, we need to be thinking Hopefully, because God has made some amazing promises. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, as we continue in that same verse that we've been looking at, in the, the latter part of that verse there in B, section B, it says, And set your hope perfectly on the grace that is to be brought unto you. What do you fix it on? On the grace that's to be brought to you. It's forward-looking. Notice as we continue... Um, Fill in another blank. We need to not only think hopefully, we need to think eternally. And this is connected. The, all of these are connected. This, this new way of thinking. We need to be proactive. We need to be hopeful. Some of you guys struggle with hopeful because you're Debbie Downer all the time and just woe is me. Instead of being hopeful and focusing not on what Satan is trying to get you to focus on, all the bad things, but get you to focus on the promises of God. That's the hopeful part. But now, connected to that is we need to think eternally, not temporally. And this is where we get the word temporary or temporarily. But we don't need to think about the temporal. We need to think about the eternal. Um, and you'll notice this emphasis throughout the letter of 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter 1.13. Later in that verse in section C, it says, This is going to be brought unto you when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, it's forward-looking to our eternity that's going to happen at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter maintains this emphasis throughout the letter. In fact, pick up in verse 23 here in 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, you've been born again, not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever. He's not talking about your physical life. He's talking to disciples and saying, listen, if they kill you as a part of this persecution you're going through, ain't no big deal. Because your life is going to last forever. This new life that you have, you've been born again. It says, because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower. The grass withers, the flowers fade. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that it's preached to you. Now, y'all know, flowers fade, right? They wilt, they fall, petals fall off, all that stuff. They don't look like they used to. We're like that. That's what the scripture says. Some of y'all don't look the, the way y'all used to, all right? Some of y'all are not your, your former selves of, of high school, right? When y'all were just all that in a bag of chips. And some of y'all are well on your way to that. You know, there is a thing called furniture disease. Some of y'all know about this, right? Is when your chest starts hanging into your drawers, right? And so that's going to happen for all of us because gravity's real. All right? But we don't need to focus on those temporary things that are going to fade. We need to focus on the things that will last forever. Our problem is Satan goes, no, 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 look at this stuff. Here's, here's the problem. All the temporary things that we focus on, that Satan says, look at this, look at this. He puts it right in our face. All those things are visible. And usually the eternal things are invisible and so it's difficult it takes a conscious thinking about this to say i'm going to think eternally in uh first peter chapter 2 verse 11 look at what it says it says friends this world is not your home so don't make yourself cozy in it don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul now i want to give you three quotes here and and i did this in this particular order for a reason let's look at the first one this is thomas akempis it says let temporal things that's the temporary things let temporal things serve thy use, but the eternal be the object of thy desire. Now, what is that? This is weird language, right? Well, I brought this, uh, brought this fellow to help us. That's your cue, Dylan. There we go. My life and my whole eternity. 
belongs to God, Willie says. All this stuff is temporary. Money, fame, success, temporary. Even life is temporary. Jesus, that's eternal. Now, so maybe Willie brought some clarification, okay, to our last Tompas of Kempis. But he's saying, look, guys, there's some things that are just, it's just stuff, and it ain't going to last. It's going to go away. Jesus, that stuff, that's going to last. So focus on those things that are going to last. And then finally, Rick Warren says it this way. He says, eternal values, things that you value that are eternal, not temporal ones, should become the deciding factors for your decisions. Some of you, I need to leave that on the screen for some of y'all. How do you make decisions? Is it based on temporary things that are not going to last beyond the grave? Or do you make the biggest decisions in your life based on eternal things? Things that are going to last beyond the grave. Finally, the last point for the morning. Not only do we need to change our thinking if we're going to be holy, we need to be more proactive, we need to be more hopeful, we need to think eternally, but also we need to commit to a different way of living. And by the way, if you'll commit to thinking different, it will lead to a different way of living. All right? But some of y'all, we need to have this as a point because some of y'all won't have it as a natural byproduct because you'll let it just stay intellectual. So we need to talk about committing to a different way of living that will come by changing our mind, but it has to go from head to heart. That doesn't seem very far, does it? But that distance, that's pretty far in a spiritual sense. We've got to let it go from head to heart to our lives. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, it says, So be done with every trace of wickedness, depravity, malignity. That's the opposite of dignity. And all deceit and insincerity, in other words, pretense and hypocrisy. He says, let go of all that stuff. And let go of grudges, envy and jealousy. And let go of slander and evil speaking of every kind. Now, here's my question. Do any of these things need to change in your life? Any of those on that list need to change in your life? He says, get rid of them totally. Get rid of them. Have nothing to do with them. But I also know... Well, let me say this. I know that there are a lot of things in that list that I need to deal with in my life. Right? But here's the thing. I also know that I have a commitment to deal with those and a plan in place. I wonder if you do. Or you just thought, yep, I got all those problems. Yep. It's confession time. I, I'm a bum. I do it all. That's cool. That's the first step. But now what's your plan going to be to actually get rid of it? But again, you've got to believe that God is going to meet you there and help you get rid of it. Otherwise, you're going to stay the same. But remember, without holiness, no one's going to see the Lord, right? You want them to see the Lord? You want to see the Lord? You better do something about it. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, listen to what it says. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. That's good news. It teaches us. What teaches us? The grace of God. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. He says, I'm not going to remove you from the present age. You're going to be right there in this present age, as jacked up as it is, as messed up as it is, as unholy and ungodly as it is, as opposite as it is in so many ways from what God wants. He goes, yep, but you're going to live self-controlled, upright, and godly in the middle of it. What does that mean? If you're holy in the middle of such a place, guess what? You stand out. Nobody wants to stand out. Very few people like the idea of just standing out, being the only one to do something. But here's the thing. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, look at what it says. And I think this is going to hit some of y'all. I know because I've had conversations with you even this week and in the previous week. I've had conversations with some of you in this audience, more than one, more than two, who have said this to me. That you, th and I feel like this passage is going to hit you. So listen. Listen to what Peter says. He says, in the past, you wasted too much time doing what those who don't know God like to do. You were living immoral lives. You were always getting drunk. You were having drinking, wild drinking parties and doing shameful things in your worship of idols. Now, 
those quote-unquote friends think it's strange that you don't that you no longer join them in all their wild and wasteful things that they do. And get this. And they say bad things about you. Newsflash. If you don't have sex before you're married, you know what's said of you? Well, must be something wrong with you. Right? What you don't like girls, what you don't like boys, something wrong with you. Man, you got to try the shoe on before you buy it. You got to test drive the car before you take it off the lot. All this nonsense. Right? And God is like, hey, sex is good, but I reserved it for marriage. And it's really good in the right context. Outside of that, it's unholy. It's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt others. But you're a weirdo if you don't do it. If you don't go drinking with your friends. Oh, I guess you're just having a little play date. That was what was said to one of my, one of the folks this week. It's like, hey, if you, uh, uh, one of them chose to go and have a one-on-one time together with just the two friends, decided to do that instead of go out partying and drinking with the whole group. And so then the group came to him and said, how'd you enjoy your little play date with each other? Right? Peer pressure at its finest. Right? Fortunately, our teens that went through that just laughed it off. But, you know, maybe, maybe they laughed it off. But at some point in time, that kind of thing gets old. That kind of thing starts wearing on you. And, it, and it's hard. But Peter goes, look, man, I didn't say it was going to be easy, but those aren't friends that say those things and act that way. You want a friend? It's someone who's going to call you to holiness. Is someone who's going to call you higher, who's willing to let you be mad at them because you won't just let them do whatever. That's love. And that's what Crossway Church is, guys. If you came here, if you're looking for a church, I'm just going to be real. If you're looking for a church where you can just come and check things off and your life just stays the same and you don't, you know, you're not interested in the mission of God or doing it. Listen, there are other places you can go hide and sit in the pew. We're trying to be life transformative for the people that come here, for the people that are part of this family, and then we want to go out and find lost people that need the same thing and help them find it. We're not trying to play church. We want to be holy and reach the unholy. When you stand out like a sore thumb and you get things said about you, listen, if you love those people that look at you crazy, When you don't join them, you'll let them continue to look at you crazy. You'll stand in the gap for those people that are saying bad things. You'll pray and fight for those people. Whether they're your friends, so-called friends, or family, or whoever they are, you'll fight for them. You'll do what it takes to see them in heaven one day. And you'll even be holy when it's hard for their sake and yours. Let me end with this. It's the last passage. 1 Peter 2.12. People who don't believe are living all around you. Hello. They may say that you're not, I'm, I'm sorry, they may say that you're doing wrong. So, here's what you do. Live such good lives that they'll see the good that you do. And they will give glory to God on the day he comes. He didn't say, look, I'm going to handle all them people. He, no, they're going to keep being them people. They're going to keep acting that way. But you Even when they say you're doing something wrong or you're being lame or you're whatever. You live such good lives that they will, it will be unmistakable. And they'll say, I see good. And I don't know why I don't have it, but I want it. And so by the time Jesus comes back, because of your example and your influence of holiness, maybe even they can praise God when Jesus gets back. The last thing on your notes, a purposeful God calls me to be a purposeful person. And a big part of that is to strive for holiness. In your bulletin this morning, you not only received a set of notes, you also got a cardstock piece of paper. Pull that out. Guests and members alike, we ask that you use this opportunity as we, as we uh, wrap this prayer up that I'm about to do and as we sing this next song. Take that opportunity to fill out this card and give God a chance this morning. This is your first opportunity to do something with with what you heard from God's word this morning. Let's pray. 
God, thank you for always loving us in spite of us. Thank you, God, for calling us to a life that maybe we didn't even think possible. I know I didn't. I didn't think it was possible to become the man that I am today. I don't have it all together, but, man, I'm different than I was. And, God, I pray for everybody in this room that they can catch a vision, your vision for them, to be drastically, night and day, different than they are, and to believe that if you called them to that, that you're going to help them get there. God, increase our faith, increase our resolve to be holy as you are holy. And, Father, this morning, for our guests and members alike, I pray that they will make the most of their time as they fill out that card. I pray they will give you a chance, um, and they'll give us a chance to be a family to them, to surround them with the love, the prayers.